from where we were uh, be a Berean. And just by way of some of you are saying, what? What is be a Berean? Uh, just we'll go ahead with some quick review while you're handing it out. Just wave your hands. That's OK. OK. So um, this is a reminder. Why did we say be a Berean? Uh, Paul and Silas and the team had been in Thessalonica. And remember, in Thessalonica, they didn't stay very long at all. And the jealousy of the Jews, oh, what a terrible, terrible thing jealousy is wherever it's found. It poisons us. It poisons others. It, it causes more damage than almost anything I know, um, both in church and out of church. And... Um, the, Thessal the Thessalonians, the, the crowd from Thessalonica, um, had, he'd been run, they'd been run out of town, had to leave Thessalonica, and then they came to Berea, and they arrived at Berea, and as we read in Acts 17, 11, and 12, the people of Berea were more open-minded, or maybe your translation says more noble, uh, than those in Thessalonica. And as we said, that surprises us a little bit because if you'll remember when we talked about Thessalonica and then we looked at the letter to the Thessalonians, first and second, wow, the Thessalonians were great, weren't they? They had such a wonderful testimony that spread out through the world. But this expression is really talking about the Jews. Um, so the Jews in Thessalonica, they knew the Old Testament scriptures, but their hearts and their minds were closed. And instead of responding with open hearts, uh, they rejected the truth of Jesus the Messiah. They rejected the gospel. Um, they responded in jealousy, and they were run off. So they come to Berea, and we see that they're more open-minded, more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why can Paul say, or why can Luke write that? Because what? They listened eagerly to Paul's message so there was an openness to listen so are you are you like that do you have an openness do you and I have an openness to listen uh, to the message or are our hearts closed or and do we feel I already know it I, I, I know these things I know these things because that's what the Thessalonians the Thessalonian Jews would have thought we know Old Testament scripture you can't tell us something about Jesus and we have to be careful as Christians especially I, I think this is a caution for those of us who have been Christians for a while for a longer time I think the the temptation or the the danger is to begin to feel like I know it I know it um, and we never oh brothers and sisters we want to come to the place where where we are confident in the Bible and in the Word of God and what we believe but we never want to get to the place where we're arrogant and when we where we feel like I know it I, I already know it you can't teach me anything it's always it's frustrating when when you have you ever come across somebody like that 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 was the feeling you can't teach me anything you can't tell me anything wow it's tough to, it's it's tough to to talk to people like that um, and it's it's very hard for the Holy Spirit even to help people like that um, you'll sometimes there'll be people uh, maybe the giveaway is when that person's um, attitude or outlook is people can't tell me anything only God can speak to me <laughs> you, seriously so we want we want to watch out for that and, and we have to watch out, especially if we're leaders and teachers, we have to watch out for that too. One of the reasons for that is that God, does God the Holy Spirit teach us? Yes, he does. But you know, God uses people and God uses brothers and sisters in the family of God to bring truth to us and to bring understanding. And do you know what that does? It helps keep us humble. Yeah? It helps keep, keep us humble. We can get very, very arrogant if we feel like, well, only God can, I know so much, only God, whatever. But when we have open hearts and our brothers and sisters can say things that minister to us and, and help us understand more, it keeps us humble with one another and it keeps us humble before God. And, and that's how we want to be. And so the Bereans listened eagerly. And secondly, they searched scriptures daily. They didn't go by what they, uh, they, they let the word of God be their guideline. Let the word of God be their standard. And all of us, if you will let the word of God be your guideline and your standard, then um, you will be in a safe place. I, I was talking with somebody recently who was sharing with somebody else 
and this person, it's nobody, nobody in Lighthouse, nobody in Hong Kong, um, this person was saying all sorts of things. God speaks to me. I've had this. I've had that. And, and one of the sisters from Lighthouse said, but the word of God says, and every time this person would go off on woo, 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 this person would say, but the word of God says, and after a while, the, the, the one who was kind of going off here and there and was very, very spiritual, basically said to Priscilla, <laughs> it was Priscilla who was telling this, um, she basically, basically said, ah, the word of God is just boring. <laughs> basically, uh, but she described it. For those of you who know China, uh, and, and a lot of us do, she said, oh, it's just like mantou. And mantou is a Chinese bread that's white and steamed and has almost no flavor. You eat it with other things that, have, that give it flavor. And that's how this person described the Word of God. Well, no wonder this person was off into all sorts of error um, because the Word of God was not enough for her. Uh, the, it wasn't Priscilla. Priscilla was trying to give good counsel, okay? And so they search scriptures daily. That's our foundation, brothers and sisters. And what else? They ask, is this teaching true? Brothers and sisters, let that always be our question. Not, do I like it? Not, does it make me feel good? Not, but what are other churches saying? Not whatever, but is this true according to scripture? And if we'll stay with these things, we will be in We'll be on safe territory, and we'll keep growing in the Lord, right? Yes. Amen. That's right. The result of that is what? Many Jews believed. And that's a great, wow, here's a simple, here's a simple tool for uh, evangelism and church growth and whatever. It's not, no, no deep secrets here, right? We, a lot of times we want deep, what's the secret? You know, um, I, I was talking with dad one time way back when, oh, in the earlier years, we'd go to all sorts of seminars. And this was in the U.S., church growth seminars. And try this and try that. And these churches had all sorts of, we did it this way and our church grew exponentially or whatever. But here's, here's a really simple, no big secret. It's just here. Now, there are ways that we can do that. There are programs that we can use that will help us do these things. But as a result, Many Jews believed, as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for the basics sometimes, right? God gives us basics and he gives us advanced classes, but all of it is needed for us to grow. And so this is what we looked at. So they believed, but again, jealousy is at work. And the crowd, the, the Jews, the jealous Jews from Thessalonica, follow them to Berea. And instead, and again, they have to run off Paul and Silas. They, they have to leave. Uh, and well, actually, so the first person to leave, they're here in Berea, they were in Thessalonica. Um, look with me, they had to leave Philippi, run out, of, uh, run out. They had to leave Thessalonica, run out. And Paul had to leave Berea, run out of town. That's a, those are pretty good credentials for preaching the truth. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Um, and we're going to see what happens. Are they going to get run out of Athens today? Uh, hint. No, they're not. And why not? We're going to find out in just a minute. And so from there, uh, Paul leaves the team in Berea, and instead he heads off to Athens uh, by himself, and he leaves the team behind. Why does Paul leave? Is Paul the coward? No, of course not. If there was ever a less cowardly person in the Bible, I don't know that there would be other, uh, uh, it wouldn't have been Paul. Um, but Paul is, do you know the expression, he's the lightning rod, right? He's, he's up the highest, and um, because he's there, he's the one that gets the attention. He's the one, he would have been the main speaker, or the main preacher, or whatever. Get Paul out of the way, and, and things settle down a little bit. I, I always, we've talked about this before, but I always think of, um, I always think of, of Paul, you know, when they say, oh, these people that turn the world upside down, they're here now. What a great testimony. What a great testimony. That, that's n often not said of, peop of, of Christians these days, but it was certainly said of Paul and company. So Paul heads off to Athens, and we talked about, uh, we talked about that. So there's the map. And then, um, so Paul is waiting for them in Athens. And I want us to look at this again just 
quickly this morning. I'm so sorry, translator, I'm talking really quickly because I want, I want to make sure we come all the way through. This is quick review and then we'll slow down when we get into the main part. But this part, I want us to think about for just a minute because we've been talking about, excuse me, about evangelism. And I want us to see something here maybe that we didn't talk about last time that looks a little bit different to us and just think on it for just a minute because there are all sorts of ways to carry out evangelism. There are all sorts of things we can do. And it starts, brothers and sisters, it doesn't start from programs. It has to come from our hearts. It has to come from our hearts. And, and I think for a lot of us, God has to God has to change our hearts sometimes. God has to soften our hearts sometimes because it's, it's easy to sort of get complacent again. For all of us, it's easy, it's easy to get that way. Apparently, the plan for Paul in Athens was not to start evangelizing. Did you know that? If you look at this, apparently the plan for Paul was to wait for Silas and for Timothy, to wait for the team, to wait for Luke and all of these others. And so he's there waiting, but because of his heart and his calling and his zeal and his, his ever grateful heart for what God has done for him, you know, I, I think that's probably where the most effective evangelism arises. When our hearts are grateful, when we remember, oh God, you have done this for me, out of that grows, I, I want to tell you what God has done for me, and he can do it for you too. Or you have felt God's love expressed, and out of that then comes a desire that others know that as well. I, that's, that's what I think. Um, and so Paul is there. He's supposed to be, it's, this is the first time he's on his own. He's waiting. He's probably resting. Uh, you know, some of us in Hong Kong, do we, we ever feel that we work hard? We do work hard, don't we? Most of us work really hard in Hong Kong. Sometimes on Monday morning, I, I stay in pajamas. Some, that's my day off. Some Mondays, I stay in pajamas. I'm sorry to shock you. I stay in pajamas all day long. I never even leave my apartment. I'm so happy, I just stay in pajamas. And I just rest, and sometimes I sleep, and, and maybe, and, and some of you say, well, I'd like to do that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but um, we work hard, but I imagine Paul needed the rest, didn't he? Paul needed some rest, so he's waiting for them. But he can't help it. As he looks around, what does he see? His spirit is just deeply troubled. Notice that he wasn't upset. It wasn't just upset, it was deep trouble as he saw that the city is full of idols. He can't help it. He's supposed to rest. He's supposed to wait for Silas and Timothy. He can't help it. Oh, look at, look at their, look at the darkness. Look at the bondage. Look at the chains. I've got to tell them about Jesus. How can I not tell these people about Jesus? How can I not tell them the good news that they can be free, that they don't have to live in superstition, that they don't have to try to give an offering to this God or to this God or to this God, or just to live their lives for pleasure and, and think that that will bring them satisfaction. I've got to tell them about Jesus. So he goes to the synagogue, and we know what he preaches in the synagogue. And then he goes to the public square, to the agora, as it was called. And we already know, um, and, and this, these were the pictures from last time, so just quickly, this was literally, this was the place where Paul walked. You say, hmm, but a pile of stones. Well, it wasn't a pile of stones and that day, but this was called the agora, or the marketplace. In the background is the Parthenon, but the Agora, the marketplace was here. But the greatest commodity, remember we talked about that, the greatest commodities of the marketplace were not fish, uh, meat, pork, tomatoes. The greatest commodities of that marketplace were words and ideas. All the philosophers, or would-be philosophers, sat around, as the Bible tells us, and did nothing all day long but discuss ideas. They all, well, have you heard about this? Well, have you heard about that? Well, there's this new teaching out of whatever. And that's what they did all along, all the time. And then along comes Paul, and he starts talking about this Jesus. They've never heard about this Jesus before. Jesus, what strange new religion is this? They didn't get angry. They didn't run him out of town. They said, huh, a new idea. 
hey, tell us about this new idea, okay? It's true. They did tell us about this. We want, we want to hear about this. So a very different reaction than other places because they prided themselves on their education and they prided, themse prided themselves on their open-minded acceptance of every idea and every new thing. That sounds kind of like today, doesn't it? And so they take Paul and they say, here, come, come before the council and tell us about this. And so Paul stands, this is Mars Hill, this is, or as it says, this is the uh, Areopagus, so it would have been here, and the philosophers and leaders would have been here. So this is here, and he says, men of Athens, I notice that you're very religious in every way. Um, and it's kind of interesting, because we talked about this before, so here is Mars Hill, Paul would have literally, he would have been standing there, and behind him was the Parthenon, the great temple to the um, to the goddess to the goddess Diana uh, um, and uh, uh, Athena. Sorry, to the goddess Athena, and this was the the patron goddess of the city. So you can imagine how appropriate it was that Paul says, "I see you're very, very religious." Remember, we talked about this these days. Instead of people saying religious, this is not just two thousand years ago. Have you ever talked with people and they will? Don't, they, they won't say they're Christian, but they will say, what's the word that, we, that people use today that's very acceptable? What do they say? I'm very spiritual. I'm very, I'm very, very spiritual. As I was preparing this this week, I, I, I just happened to look on uh, Now TV. I, 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 get, uh, I subscribe to Now TV. And I just started clicking through. And do you know what I found? I thought, what? And there were a few that I knew about. There are five shows, five right now on Now TV that have mediums, spirit mediums. And they're not woo, they don't look weird, they don't use a, a crystal ball, they look like normal people. They look just whatever and they'll walk around and they'll say, oh, spirit told me something, something, something about that. Five, five shows. They don't talk about Jesus, but they're very, spiritual. So when somebody talks to you about, oh, I'm very spiritual, you might want to say, be more specific because demons are spirits too. You know? It's true. Demons are spirits, demons are spirits too. And it's become, I was thinking about it, um, and I'm not trying to just, I'm not trying to preach TV shows, but very often TV shows are a window they tell us what is becoming more and more popular and when I saw that I thought oh Lord it's it's very very popular it's very very popular and I and I, I told you the example of the Kardashians that they have a it really they and I'm not trying to preach against the Kardashians they need Jesus too. Uh, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian they have a church service every morning uh, every Sunday morning they don't talk about Jesus everybody's welcome Muslim, you're welcome. You'll feel right at home here. Buddhist, you're welcome. You'll feel right at home, home here. And they have a Sunday service, and it's becoming the hit of Hollywood. How sad. But that gives us, that gives us a window into the, the, what, the, the trends. So you and I are in this society, brothers and sisters, and some of you may say, well, that's not my world. It will be your world. This is what's coming. And so what we see here in Paul and Athens shows us how we can live and how we can respond and how we can interact with people who are like this and have this outlook. So, let's look at it. Paul says, I see you're religious in every way. He doesn't condemn. And brothers and sisters, if you start with condemnation, you've closed every door anyhow. If somebody doesn't have Jesus and they don't know Jesus, they're condemned already. They're condemned already. And so there's no point in saying, oh, you're this or you're that. Paul starts with a common ground. I see that you're very religious. And then what happens next? We talked about this last time. He says, I saw your objects of worship and I saw this, this uh, uh, altar to the unknown God. Now this is not the one that was in Athens, but in fact, this was in another city and this is an altar to an unknown God from that time or from before that time. And Paul says, I saw um, an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Look at what Paul says next. It is wonderful. And he says, now what you worship as something unknown, 
I am going to proclaim to you. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world right now, plenty of people, God is unknown to them. God is unknown to them. And you and I have the privilege, the privilege, forget the duty and the responsibility. Yes, we have a duty and responsibility too. We have the privilege to tell people who don't know God about the God that you and I know. Amen? It's the God that we know. And what we know of God, it's good. It's good. And we're going to see it. Paul's going to talk about it here. He says, I'm going to proclaim to you. And I told you before the story, uh, the, the uh, story of how that came about. Remember that? There was a plague in Athens and uh, uh, Epimenides, for those of you that know Greek and uh, Greek uh, history and things like that, said, oh, you have offended uh, a god, but you don't know which one it is. And so let loose a herd of sheep um, or goats, let them loose in the city, and wherever one sits down, if it's not near a, if it's not near any temple, then build an altar there and sacrifice that sheep to the unknown god, and then the plague will leave the city. How superstitious. Now, in just a minute, we're going to see how that still plays out in our world today. But that's what they did, and that's what Paul, literally, that's what he sees as he walks through the city. It was one of those altars that was still there from almost 600 years earlier. And so he starts there. Brothers and sisters, where do you start when you want to tell people about this God that you know? Start on common ground. Start on common ground. Um, if you say, well, I can't learn this, 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 and this, okay, start with what you know. Start on common ground. You can always find common ground with somebody. Most of the time, we are, we have an attitude of, I'm not anything like them. But you know what? The Holy Spirit can show us where our common ground is. And that's where Paul starts. And so, he begins to talk. So look with me um, as we, at, at this, if you're taking notes, you can take notes. If you'll go back to, we're not going to look at that this morning for the sake of time. Most of Paul's preaching is recorded. It's for Jews and it's in synagogues. But if you look in Acts 14 and then look at this, it's almost the same. The ideas are the same. Uh, in Acts 14, uh, 11, through, 11 through 18. Remember that was the first missionary journey. They were in Lystra. Uh, they heal a man, who's, a man who's lame, and the people start worshiping them as gods. And they say, no, 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 don't worship us. We are people like you. God is the God of creation. And it's actually um, very similar to what Paul says here. What does he say? This is a wonderful me message. For those of you that are interested in philosophy, um, and in philosophers and in humanism and agnosticism and atheism and some some of you are you study those things what Paul says in this short recorded message answers almost any philosophy of the world today that does not exalt God as the one true God everything is here really everything is here so what does Paul say he says I'm gonna tell you about this God you don't know so what does he tell them he is the God, look with me, who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. Or it says he gives everything. So what does Paul tell us here? Look with me very quickly. Okay, I'll try to move out of the way. What does Paul say? Let's look at some of the points. There's much more here, but we're going to, I promise we're going to finish up this this morning. First of all, Paul says there's one God. Remember what I told you last time? How many, how many idols or how many temples, how many gods were worshipped in the city of Athens? Remember this from last time? More than 30,000. There were more gods and temples than there were people in Athens, more than 30,000. And in the face of that, Paul says, there's one God. There's one God. 
not 30,000. There's one. Remember the story I told you at, uh, last time about the woman uh, in Singapore that went to the temple every day and she would work and she would bow and she would give, she'd burn incense to all the idols. And then one day she looked at him and she said, they can't all be true. Remember that? This is from mom and dad in Singapore. And she prayed, God, whichever one of you is real, if you'll tell me who you are, I will worship you and you only. And that night, vision or a dream, an angel appeared and said, go to this address, 1A Kim Cat Road, and that's where the church was where mom and dad were pastoring. And she gave her heart to the Lord. This very same lady led part of her family to the Lord, and then she died. She got very sick and she died. And she went to heaven. Now some of you are saying, ooh, she went to heaven. And the Lord said, and she, was, she said it was wonderful. And the Lord said, the Lord told her, you can't stay. You have to tell the rest of your family about me and about heaven. And she was revived. And in the time that she had left, in the years that she had left, she led the rest of her family to the Lord. And when mom and dad went back, Years later, and they gathered together, that lady, I think at that point she had already then passed away and gone to heaven, but in the great banquet that were there, there were three tables of people that were, they were her family, her relatives, her children, her grandchildren, her nieces and nephews that she had led to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, tell people about the one true God. Tell people about the one true God. Amen. Amen. And so there's one God, and as the creator of everything, he's the creator of spirit and of matter, okay? He made the world and everything in it. Well, that goes against a lot of philosophies that, that people have today. Um, we've talked before uh, some of the, some of the uh, uh, who was the, who was the, uh, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking that passed away about a year ago now, right? The, the brilliant, brilliant scientist, absolute atheist, who died completely and totally rejecting God, said the time will come when we have, we have no need of God because we have knowledge. And now he knows. Um, but God would have wanted him to know him. And Paul says he's the creator of spirit and matter. What else does he say? He doesn't live in what we have made. The most beautiful temples, brothers and sisters, the most beautiful churches and cathedrals, Notre Dame that was largely burned a few months ago, God does not live in those things that have been made by us. He doesn't live in man-made temples. Where does he live? He lives in us. Who has made us? He has made us. And that's why he doesn't live in a man-made temple. He lives in us. We are his temple. And then what else does he say? He doesn't need anything from us. And you say, well, I know that. I know that. No, we don't always know that. Sometimes we think, what can I do? God, what, what does God need? I need to do this. I need to please him. I need to do something to appease him. I need to do this and then God will be happy with me. And Paul says he doesn't need anything from us. Uh, most of you know that uh, I've told you before that my, I regularly in the week I walk the mountain behind my house and uh, I get some exercise and I have some prayer time and I li listen to the birds and whatever. And last night I was walking up and I was just miserable. It was so hot. It was so humid and I was just dripping sweat and, and mosquitoes were biting me and I thought I'm not having a good time right now. Um, but I wanted to anyhow because I'd been inside all day and preparing. But I was thinking about this. He doesn't need anything from us. A few months ago, as I was climbing the mountain, um, I've, about mi halfway up the mountain, there are three little shrines, man-made, of course, with little idols in them, Gunyam and then some of the others. I don't know the names of all of them, but I'll bet some of you do. And as I walked by, I saw something, and I just laughed. I laughed and laughed and laughed. And then I thought, how sad. And this is what I saw. You see, you see what, what the God needs? I don't know. 
Uh, what God is this? That's that one there. Which one is that? Is it the God of war or something like that? Guan. Guan. Okay. Guess what God Guan needs? He needs a smoke. <laughs> Can you see it? Somebody had offered him a cigarette. And I did. I, I really laughed. I really did. I thought, how ridiculous. How ridiculous. But then I thought about it more and I thought, how sad. Really, how sad. He doesn't need things from us. He doesn't need things from us. And that's what Paul says. He is the, uh, seriously, I mean, you look at that and you think, that's just crazy, right? Yes. It's, just, it's just crazy. But you know what? Before we laugh too much at this, people, you can meet plenty of people that kind of feel that way about God today. What does God, what does God need? What do I need to do? And Paul says he is the what? He's the source of life. He himself gives life and breath to everything and he satisfied satisfies every need that's why I think abortion is a big deal that's why I think abortion is a big issue life comes from God life comes from God he's the one he's the source of life and so what Paul says right there he says those things and then he keeps on talking and he says uh, and and he is generous and good he gives everything so there's an unknown God, brothers and sisters, and you're around people that God, and, and God is unknown to them. And they don't know that God is good. And they don't know that God is generous either, do they? They think God is hard. They think God is mean. And he's not easy to please, right? And he's waiting to hit them on the head if they do something wrong. That's not how God is. And then he keeps on talking and Paul says, from one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth, and he has determined the times and boundaries of where they live so that they might seek God, and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. Do you worry about your country and about what's happening and about these things? Paul's words tell us that God is in control of human history. He's in control of human history. What else do these words tell us? All of us are made from one man. One man. Look around the church for just a minute. Look at the colors of skin in this, in this room right now. I, I'm probably the whitest one here, except for Steve. Steve is pretty white too. I, I would like to have darker skin, frankly. I, for years, I would lie out in the sun hoping for darker skin. And then we've got every shade in between, right? Examine your hearts. Examine your attitudes. Examine your outlook. We are made from one. Let there never be in us, brothers and, brothers and sisters, any shade, any hint of racism or sup ethnic superiority or ethnic inferiority in any way, we come from one. We come from one. Let there be none of that in us. What else? Our meaning and purpose is in finding God. Look at this. God determined where we would live, the boundaries of where we are, so that we might seek God and perhaps reach out and find Him. By the way, those words do not mean, well, maybe you'll reach out and maybe you can find God. That's not the meaning of that, although that's how it looks when you read it. What it means is God's desire is for people, wherever they are, to reach out. And if they reach out, they will find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. Brothers and sisters, some of you feel sometimes God's a million miles away. He's not. He's close. He's close to you. And guess what? He's close to people out there in the world as well. This message is not, it, it's not, we're Christians here this morning and it's for us. But brothers and sisters, Paul is speaking to pagans 
this, in, this, in this sermon. Paul was speaking to people who had 30,000 idols and gods, and he says to them, he's not far from you. The worst person that you know, the vilest person around you, the meanest son of a gun or whatever that you are around, God is not far from them. But how are they going to reach out and find him? It's going to be through you. It's going to be through me. And Paul says, God's not far. And God has put us where we are, that we might know him, that we might reach out to him, that we might find him. That's God's plan for us. That's God's purpose for us. That's God's highest for every single person. And when we know that, and when we have that, everything else in our lives falls into place. If there are things out of order, if there are things out of order in your life this morning, my question to you is, where is God in your life this morning? What is God in the terms of priorities in your life? I have found in my own life that when God is not the first, when God is not the priority, when I've got other things in that way, it's, it's because God is not first. Nothing else is in order. And God offers and God gives. He says, I'm not far. Reach out. Seek me. Find me. And I'm not far from you. What else does Paul say? In a, Paul say? He has placed in us a desire to know him. Oh, you know, sometimes those that are the harshest and the hardest against God and against Jesus are people who secretly are fighting God. They're fighting God. God's been, God's been reaching after them and they're fighting just as hard as they can. He puts in us a desire to know Him. There's a beautiful verse in the Old Testament, in Ecclesiastes 3.11. Remember I told you that another title for this could be Traces of Truth? Remember, I, I said to me that would be a, another title for this. Look with me. Can we read it together? This is so wonderful. Shall we read it together? He has put eternity in man's heart. He's put eternity there. God has put something in every being for eternity, for something that goes beyond clothes, money, food, prestige, top of the food chain, successful businesswoman, famous, popular, beautiful, talented. These are things of this world. And he's put in every heart something eternal, eternal, that is only met and only satisfied in the one who is eternal, in God, in God. He is not hard to find. He's not hard to find. He's not far away. It's not a bunch of rules. It's relationship. And then he says, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Being God's offspring then, we shouldn't think that divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Evangelism. Again, you say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, you, you pastors, you've been talking a lot about evangelism. Here's one more point for you, okay? What does he say? Again, it's a common ground. Some of your own poets have said, some of you have said, do you know why Paul can say that? He can say that because God has put eternity in man's hearts. He can say that because there are traces of truth in every culture, every culture, the worst, cult, the culture that's furthest from God, you will find traces of truth. Why? Because he's God. And his truth is everywhere. His truth is everywhere. God help us to find that and to see that. And so that's, that's what he says. Years ago when I was in university, I had a professor that I really liked. He was so smart. He was, he was my Western Civ, Western Civilizations professor. But... He was a total atheist, total atheist. And he loved 
to mock Christians in his class. In fact, he would find out those who really were Christians and he would, he would laugh at us and he would belittle us and he'd make mockery of us. And he'd bring up things from Western civil civilization like, you know, about, the, about Noah and the flood. And he would say, oh, the, I still remember it, the Epic of Gilgamesh. I, I can't pronounce it exactly. I don't remember so well now, anyhow. And he'd say, uh, there's, a, there's a story of the flood in, in the Epic of Gilgamesh. You know, so it's just an old, it's just an old fable. It's just an old that. And I was a little bit, I thought, oh, there is for about five seconds. <laughs> and then I realized there are traces of truth everywhere. There are traces of truth. Brothers and sisters, when you see and hear traces of truth in various things, don't be drawn away and think, oh, well, maybe this is true. Oh, well, maybe this is true. No. Instead, let those things point to the one true God who has set us on this earth and is not hard to find. Amen? Traces of truth. And so, he says, so what do we learn from that? If we're his offspring, we are responsible to have right ideas and understanding of God. What do you think about God this morning? You're responsible to learn about Him and to know about Him. What else? God is not like us. We are like God. You say, well, huh? God is not like us. We are like God. And we're going to come to this point. Look, I'm sorry, I know it's really long, but let me, if, if you can see it. So God is not like us. We are like God. My question to you, and we're coming to very, very, we're coming right near the end now. My question is this this morning. We look at the Athenians. We say, oh, 30,000 idols. What pagans. So ignorant. We look at other cultures and we think, look at all these gods. Look at all this. Look at all that. They're so superstitious. They worship this. They worship that. May I tell you this morning that there is a God of this age that is worshipped, especially in Western cultures and Western civilizations, more highly than any Athenian god, than any other god. Do you know what that god is? Man. 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 Who is exalted in these days? Man. His accomplishments. We can do this. We can do that. Oh, they're so smart. Oh, he, he created the supercomputer, blah, 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 blah. Stephen Hawking, he did this, he did that. Oh, look at our creation. Or, whatever I want is okay. Whatever I want to do, I'm the highest. And we exalt and we honor men and women today, don't we? We really do. That's what we exalt. That's what we worship today, right? That's what's worshipped today. That is just as idolatrous as anything from Athens. Some of you are kind of looking at me. Take a little bit of time to process it. But I'll tell you for sure, those of us from Western cultures and Western societies, we would, this is definitely true. Man is, man is it. Man is it. And Paul says in Romans, look at what he says. I thought, oh, this is such a picture of you and me today. And he wrote this 2,000 years ago. They knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give thanks. Remember what Stephen Hawking said? When we have enough knowledge, we won't need God anymore. They began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. Their minds became dark and confused, claiming to be wise. They instead became fools, and instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like people and birds and animals and reptiles. May I say to you, that's today. That's today, isn't it? That's today. And so, what do we do with it? Paul comes to the end and he says, God used to overlook this ignorance earlier, but now, he says, Repent and turn to him, for he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he has proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. So this morning, as we close, these are the verses. What does this tell us? Some of you here this morning are not Christians. Much of this earlier part was for those of us who are Christians. But we come to a point where we have to make a decision. Do you know what the Athenians said when they heard this? They laughed at him. Did you know that? They la let me, in fact, hang on, let me just. They laughed in mockery. So my question is, how are we going to respond? You see, the Athenians were just window shopping. 
They were just interested in ideas. They weren't, they weren't interested in action. Do you know I meet people all the time who are happy to talk, but they're not interested in action. Oh, you can talk about God all you want to, but I'm not interested in changing my life. Oh, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, God is good, but I want to live my life the way that I want to. That's making a man a God. And so what do we do? What he says... He says, we have to, this, here's what God says to us. Sin separates us from God. God has given us a way to have a relationship with him through Jesus. And God sets the requirements, not man. People don't decide. God decides. God decides. And risen Jesus is our answer. Panina, I want you to come back up again. And the worship leader, the, the wor uh the musicians and the um, we don't have keyboard now but let's just let's sing the let's sing the living hope again just come on up and I want us just to respond to the Lord this morning Paul says oh, it's not in there Paul says for I'm not ashamed of the good news about Christ it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. Amen. Brothers and sisters, would you join me this morning and let's stand in response to the Lord this morning. If you have felt far from God, it's time. God says, I'm not far away. If you say, well, I'm interested to listen but I don't want to change my life God says that's not good enough you have a responsibility amen shall we respond to the Lord this morning let's turn to the, it's the last song again yeah how great the chasm that lay between just respond to the Lord this morning how high the mountain I could not
your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the rain has no claim on me Jesus Christ you're my Lord, this morning, we thank you that we can say amen to everything that Paul preached in that message. Renew that in our hearts, we pray. Oh, Lord, as we go out and face our world, our home, our work, our employers, renew our hearts of gratitude. Lord, may we recall again what you have done for us as we have sung this morning. You've broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Oh, Lord, you have set us free from all of these things. And Lord, out of this gratitude, out of this thankfulness, Lord, may it overflow. Lord, give us chances. Give us opportunities to tell people around us about the God they do not know, but that we know. Oh, God of love, who's given us life and given us hope and broken every chain, praise your name. Praise your name. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.